This place is actually called Cahar Bullig on the side of a mountain in West Kerry called Eagle Mountain, Schlieve on Uller. The Uller is an eagle, uh, Schlieve in Irish uh, is a mountain. And from my next door neighbour, Antonio Griffin, uh, an old man who's lived here for uh, all, of his, he, all of his generations, still live here through him, I suppose. And Anton reckons from the oral history of the area, this is Cahar Bullig, which is the city of the Bullig, which is the Fir Bullig, uh, that this is an ancient Irish city and stronghold, um, which is in keeping with a lot of the a lot of the, the, the history of this area that's it's it's littered with old cairns, city walls, um, outcrops on top of mountains, all with its own beautiful oral history. Um, so we kind of landed ourselves in the middle of it. We were back here in this Irish speaking area for a couple of years, myself and Siobhan, and then we went east into Aunascall, which was kind of back into civilization in some respects. Uh, and we just got the invite back west recently when we were kicked out of our house in the middle of this breakdown uh, in Aunascall and we had to move back to West Kerry and thankfully the Gardaí didn't choose to stop us on our journeys back and forth but we have finally landed back in the West Kerry Gaeltacht and it's such a um, you'd feel very privileged to be here amongst that kind of these kind of people who you can sit in and drink tea with and hear about a history that is just inaccessible, inaccessible to many books, inaccessible to a lot of places uh, where you would want to learn about them. It's just this very rich oral tradition. So it's lovely to be here. But, uh, sometimes you have to do something so strange. Sometimes when the world is caving in on you in the way that it sometimes does, when everything has to be followed and we have so many obligations and so many fixations and we have all of these things that sometimes to break free of that, you have to do something as mad as walk backwards across China and nothing else will do only to walk backwards across China. Uh, to do something as mad as that, to break free of your social sense of yourself and your, your sense of who you are, as, as John would say, on the high street. To let go of that, to let that down for a while by doing something that is unimaginable to, to that person or to that, to, that, to that force inside of you. There's the sportsman who is just enthralled and driven really really driven in a game um, and this is actually where a lot of my the uh, the love that I have for Patrick O'Leary uh, comes from as well as we share this Patrick was also a great hurler um, and we I would have played the game and fallen in love with the game as a young fella like fallen in love with it in the way that you do things out of like out of time, you know, four hours. Some of you played for four hours. You, play, you were gone for five hours and you're like, Jeannie, I don't know, was I gone for 10 minutes or 10 hours? And I don't care because I was just playing this thing that I loved. And I did that for a long, long time. And then when I got to the very top of the game, playing with Wexford, uh, I noticed that along the way, I be had become quite dependent maybe on my social sense of myself based around Dermot the Hurler and Dermot the successful hurler, and Dermot the good hurler, and Dermot who scored two points, and Dermot who played in the big game, and all of that stuff. Uh, and I found that maybe, at the time I suppose I didn't know, I was just in it, and that, and that was it. Um, and so I continued playing, but over time, and there's a lovely book uh, that I haven't read, I saw the title of it, and I didn't feel I even needed to read the book after just seeing the title of it, because I could write the book myself, called The Body Keeps the Score. Um, which was written, I think, last year. I see a few heads going that have already come across it. And it's like, for every story uh, and for every contrivance and for every moment of maybe untruth, the body was keeping track. And eventually, at 27, I went into this treatment room uh, called a cryotherapy chamber that's used to heal muscles that are damaged and stuff like that. And I had obviously pushed myself too far over too long. I had come too far too fast. And the ice chamber froze my body and I couldn't sleep, eat, drink. I was thrown up. I was just finished. Uh, my, my body refused to work anymore and refused to function anymore. And even, as, even though it went very low, um, that social being that craved acceptance and affection and all of those things uh, pushed on. And for three more years... I played with this like just totally obliterated system, um, captain the team for two of the years and, and pushing everybody else, even though I couldn't even 
I, I couldn't, you know, I was teaching, I was a teacher, bed, training, bed, and it was repeat, and that was, and that was it. I knew that I had to stop, um, and I went off traveling, and I found an, a, a viewpoint, as we, as we all probably do, when we get to stand back for a little while and look back in and say, okay, these are all of the things that are happening, and this is why they're happening. And it became, I suppose, quite clear um, so I went back, I came back home after my travels, tried to play the game in a more balanced, with a more balanced relationship towards it, where I discovered the love that the, the young fella had had uh, years before in Wexford in, in the southeast of Ireland. Um, and I found it, but my body still was keeping, was keeping track. My body still was saying, you can go so far, but past that point, you can go no more. And so I ended up, I remember, on the field... In I'd say November, um, after a heavy training session, and I got a fairly innocuous knock to the chest, and I went down and I went to get some breathing. And when I was away, I had discovered, you know, meditation and yoga and these things, breathing techniques. And I went down, and I just thought, okay, this is it now. You're going to need to get your breath, so relax into your body and really tune into your breath. But I maybe lay there in the in the frost for I'd say an hour. Everybody was gone, gone. They all went. They were gone. They were gone home. There was nothing they could do for me. And I knew at that point then that I had to call it a day. So I did, and continued to live up in. I moved up to Dublin and worked on radio at a sports show and worked with SOAR, uh, an organisation who run workshops with fifteen and sixteen year olds on trying to align them with their purpose. Um, and all very enjoyable work. And through that, I met the likes of Cathy and Lydia and this amazing group of people who were doing amazing stuff in, in Dublin and in Ireland. Uh, but I found that the, even though it was all good stuff, the draw was still, it was still to go, keep going, keep going. And eventually, again, uh, I, I, I didn't decide to move to West Kerry, I suppose. I was decided, like it decided me. I had to follow the decision that was made by some other force that brought me down to West Kerry um, looking for connection with my with myself with my culture with my language um, and actually as well do you know probably people recognize sometimes where you get into a bit of a funk or you things aren't going so well for you and you start you start feeling like you're doing damage to other people as well and once that happens I suppose you have, that's the, the great time to act then because you can't stomach that anymore and so I went off down to West Kerry um, not knowing what I was coming down to and not really knowing why I'd come but very soon after coming down here I came across this writer uh, and this this man John Moriarty he had passed away at the time uh, he, he died in 2007 I think um, and his writings had a profound impact on me in terms of wildness that's it's, it's all i can say is wildness wildness in every sense of it wildness inside wildness outside wildness outside I me mean, to be out in the wildness to understand what or to not understand it to just be out in it and to uh allow that wildness to have its way with you for a little while and his writings uh and his talks gave me permission to do that in a way that i never would have arrived i don't think at that uh, juncture myself um, and so through John as a portal uh, and with John as a guide I went out into the wild places in West Kerry and found that my own native language of Irish that I didn't grow up with and didn't have uh, a great connection with up until I was 23 or 24 that that would be uh, that, that, that the signposts in wild nature were written in Irish and that was a tremendous discovery because I mean I didn't know that our, that's what was in our language I thought it was a subject in school I didn't realize that this was that this was the the scripture like this was the language of nature the, the Irish language I didn't understand the myth until afterwards which is which is kind of a shame um, because now I realize, and it's like sacrilegious words uh, to say it, to ever say it, in, in the, the GA is the, the organization, the body, the, the community that uh, governs this game of hurling, this ancient game. Um, and to say, to utter the line, to have the temerity to utter the line, I am Cucullin, is akin to saying, I am Jesus Christ. Like, you can't say it, you know, because you'll be locked up in an institution of some sort. By, by people who maybe don't understand such things. But for a while, 
it wasn't that I was Cucullin, but the, the archetype of Cucullin was alive in me and I could access it or it accessed me or whatever it was. Um, because you would do things and you would see things that otherwise would be, I mean, yeah, they're just not accessible, you know, slowing down of time, the understanding of what everybody else was doing, the rhythm of the game and being in it in a way that the intellect was gone. And I know there are sporting, sports psychology and stuff breaks all this stuff down and that this is why this happens and it's flow state and everything else. But sometimes I could feel from the time that I was young in Ireland, we learned the story of Cullen and I could feel from the time I was young that my journeys to Crow Park where this game is played in front of 80,000 people, I was carrying, as Cullen did, a spear and a shield and a ball and I would hit the ball up ahead on my journey up the N11 to Crow Park and I would run up after it and I would catch the hurl and I would throw the spear and I would catch the spear and I would throw the shield and I would catch the shield. And that was the, that was the Imram, that was the journey I was on. Um, and I feel tremendously grateful now that that happened and, and because it did, uh, I have found that hurling since I finished has actually given, is continuing to give me it's, it's continuing to give me far more than I ever, ever could have imagined. Be on, be lum, be gasta, be kroger, be kasta, be lauder, be glick, be grover, gelgoirach, be soccer lastig, be dianach, be edrum, gantanus erbe, ed the Bid the cree, the cow in Sinchli in the current to two henny lahar repeco luder nevil to. Be yawn dum, be lauder el don and nor a cassin and down. Be yawn dum, a shulam with the kail and nor a hagan and hound. Oh, you mock a heater Lani me rai ga fiu ma ko hiter fai bo no ni der handa wo ne fiu ma ko hiter fai. So the second part of the song move it moves into a line that says, uh, "Lani me rai ga fiu ma ko hiter fai." I put up the lyrics. Maybe it's a beautiful, beautiful song. Uh, but the second part of it is. Lani may arrive few mako heater five. I will continue on my journey, even if you try to destroy me, basically. And so I went up into the field and I was up on the high rock beside this beehive hut and I sang that song out loud in the joy of the last few days. And after I was finished my singing to me myself and the birds up on the high rock, I went back down the fields and arrived back down to the house. When I went down to West Kerry and I met John Moriarty uh, in his re writings and his teachings, I asked for my wild nature to come to the surface uh, fearlessly and to just to be in that uh, way of living a little bit more. I, I stayed a little, for a little while out on the Blasket Islands a few years ago and worked out there for a couple of summers, a really, really magical island off the coast of West Kerry. And um, like magical in the way that when I was there in this eight weeks in total that I was there, nine weeks, three people came out who had cancer and they would just go off and sleep at the back of the island for healing from the island, that kind of a place. Um, and I spent a bit of time there and I thought, Jeannie, I'd love to run a retreat here. And so when I met Siobhan and these ideas began to flourish about wild food foraging, about wild hurling, uh, this idea that I was beginning to develop um, about the game not being so organized that we could just play anywhere that we could play in the road or in the field or on the beach because why can't we because we can play wherever we want to play and it doesn't need to be in a GA club um, and so some of these things began to the, we saw the great possibility of the meditation and the yoga that all just went perfectly hand in hand as uh, so we tried to run one out on the Blasket Islands but thank God a storm came through and we couldn't um, because there's nothing on the island and it would have been a nightmare uh, in hindsight but it brought us to Bruna Gráige this building overlooking Clahar and Ceann Shibail in West Kerry um, by Ballyferreter for anybody who knows it and there that was where myself and Siobhan walked endless amounts of sunsets and foraged and picked seaweed and collected and made 
salves and creams and did all of the things that we then wanted to share. We also have this kind of habit of like we're we're in the process of of making um you know, different wines and beers and whatever different from the wild foods we're collecting at the moment. But once we do it, once we decide we're teachers, uh, we should we should just we should we should teach everybody. Um, so we had done some of these things and they were very new to me, but but we just felt that not so much as teachers, but actually as people who just shared, we want to just share what bit of information we have and mix it with a group of 20 people, for example, um, to share in the, with them the experience of collecting wild food and carrying that right through to having a body cream or a toothpaste or whatever it was that you would do that whole process with them um, in, a, in a kind of an exploration. Um, and the language is a huge barrier, a huge source of shame for Irish people. Unbelievably so. Um, it's really, it's, it's gut-wrenching to see it, um, but beautiful by the end of the weekend to see that in action, in just shoulder to shoulder, doing things, not putting a huge focus on learning the, the, the structures of the language, um, but doing poetry in Irish uh, and having conversations in Irish that otherwise people wouldn't have uh, you see a different part of them come out by the end of the weekend. And that was the aim of it from the start, was to see what we learned ourselves, I suppose, was that there was, in this search for our wild nature, that there was an energy source that was required or that was that assisted you in that journey. And through the language, through the language awakening in us to some degree, and even only not to a perfect fluency or anything, just to some degree, that that provided uh, that energy and enthusiasm to go further out into um, out into West Kerry, I guess, for us, uh, but into this journey of sharing the language with our people. I think it's probably the most prescient question for myself on a day-to-day -day basis, particularly talking about these things and feeling these things in the way that I do. And so um, I think maybe it's just a very relevant question in, in, in general. Um, and it's around what, what your relationship is with wild nature. What like what is your relationship with wild nature? Like in, in your not in the intellectual ideology of it or how important it is or anything like that, but how and maybe it's an internal wild nature, um, or maybe it's an external in, in the nature around us. But what just if you could consider what that is in the daily or the weekly movements of your of your of your life to really consider what that what that is and as judgment free and as willing it to be something different or anything like that completely utterly irrelevant stuff just what is your relationship with wild nature <laughs>